evening, everybody. We're going to get started here. Welcome to, welcome to our Wednesday night soiree. Uh, hopefully you're here to study the book of Revelation. Um, there, there's a study of Philemon, but it's in the church down the street if you were interested in an easier book. But, um, sorry, <laughs> somebody thought it was funny. So if you guys, we're going to sing a couple songs and bless the food and pray a little bit. And uh, uh, so this will be fun. So this is a really old song called The Father of Lights. It was written by, I think, John Barnett. It's like, it's really old. It's one of the first songs I ever learned when I joined the vineyard back in many, many years ago. So we'll see how this goes. Why don't you guys all stand? Father of lights, you delight in your children.
of God, but for what I've done, what I've not, you, my Jesus, strengthen fortress, my hope and Did you guys enjoy um, Matthew's worship leading tonight? Thank you. I don't know why. I was really nervous for some reason. I don't know why. I've been playing that song for like 25 years. So. Well, you hit it well. Well, thank you. Yeah. Feliz Navidad. 
I actually, so I used to live in Miami. I lived in Miami like full time for five years, and I can actually watch Spanish television if I don't need to know what's going on. Um, so I don't actually, I, I kind of understand it, and I have a good accent, but I have no, I don't actually speak Spanish. Yeah. I need to learn. I'm kind of ashamed. Who, man, woman? Tortilla Soup's a good movie. I don't think so. That's with uh, Hector Alonso. It? That's a good movie. Something. Oh, no, sounds interesting. I think um, Jose Feliciano uh, is actually the Antichrist. <laughs> Which is why I wanted to play that song over and over again. Uh, she won't watch it. Maybe she will. Um, we're, 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 we, we always sing Feliz Navidad at Christmas, so that's like the final song we do. Rio 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 is a much better Spanish carol, I think. But yeah, Rio 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 is the name of a uh, Spanish carol. But it might be Mexican. I don't know. It's in Spanish. Yeah, cool. Well, uh, you notice Spanish is like becoming a prominent thing in our church now. It's almost like we live in a giant multicultural society. We're it's starting. Yeah. Lot. yeah. Exactly. Crazy. Um, so I forgot to make an announcement. Um, as far as I know, about six of you are have done this, have stuck with the student version of this class, and so if if I haven't talked to you and Lois, you and I talked, and you're still a student, let me know because we're going to organize um, the the student thing. Um, so, is there any students that I haven't talked to that are like you've been doing all the work? Okay, so we should be good. So, all right. Um, so, um, and for the benefit of those watching on YouTube, the student version is. Uh, taking colored pencils and highlighting the text to see the themes that are here in the little wheel of theme. Yep. And also reading uh, Hendrickson's book. Yes, and reading the book, which and is good. Also which showing is good. the camera. And uh, doing a final project. Yes, and the final project. Yeah. Are you a student? I just haven't figured that out okay. yet, actually. <laughs> so. All right. So um, tonight we're going to talk about... Um, this is the shortest uh, section, just two chapters of Revelation. It's the seven bowls. And um, I actually thought this would be one of the uh, less interesting sections, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, I found this section very, very compelling. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna, to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, discuss the relationship between uh, salvation and wrath uh, or pain and repentance, uh, or I should, should keep it in the same order, repentance and pain. Uh, we're going to contrast the people of God and uh, the, the people uh, who have not yet uh, in, encountered or given themselves to God. And we're going to talk about that, how it relates to not just the future thing, but as we've approached everything this, with this class, we're going to talk about how it, what it looks like now. So we're going to attempt to discuss the bowls as if it's an active thing happening right now. And if so, what, what does that mean and what does it look like? So... Uh, before we do that, uh, Matthew has a end of the world segment for us. Uh, we might actually can we reverse and do the uh, the uh, ancient world moment first? Let's do it. So the thing I wanted to talk about uh, is the Roman Empire had a bunch of what are called civic and trade or voluntary associations. You're on page fifty nine, if you want. Yeah, this is on page fifty nine, and I I had actually forgotten to write down in the class notes why this was interesting, right? So, Roman society had four kinds of civic organizations. There were trade organizations where everybody, a member of that effectively club, was part of the same trade, uh, a weaver or a tent maker or a, a, a fabric uh, dyer or a fuller or a blacksmith or a carpenter or whatever. There were religious associations where everybody in the association was a member of the same religion. Kicker to that one, though, is it had to be a recognized Roman religion, which Christianity was not at this time. Um, the third one was what was called a household association. Okay, can I jump in? Sure. Do you have any idea how many officially recognized um, religions were there? There were a there? bunch. So literally one for every god or goddess or spirit or teaching. Okay, um, of any of the conquered peoples. Of any of the conquered peoples, right. So the idea was if you moved to the big city, you could find an organization the Romans are really suspicious of revolution and rioting, right? And so the clubs have to be recognized by the state. They don't have an idea of freedom of association. 
So you have to have an actual reason to be meeting together that's legitimately recognized as in the interest of the state. And they had a list of approved gods. Based list on of approved gods. That's for the religious ones. When they conquered the Jews, uh, the approved religion was yep. approved God was Yahweh. And then Christianity came in. Jesus as a God came in after they had already. Yep. And if you remember this, uh, the, Jew, the Jewish religious association in whatever city you found yourself in, you got exempt from the sacrifices to the emperor, right? So you had special legal status as a member of one of these guilds. By far and away, the most powerful ones were the trade associations. They, they, they actually survive into the Middle Ages as guilds, right? We see one of these in the book of Ephesians where I think it's Demetrius talks about a member of the Silversmith Guild. And this would have been the association of all the people that made their living making shrines to the, the goddess Artemis in, in Ephesus. Question, Jeff? Jeff asked the question, were they like ancient unions? They were a, a more similar to what a union would have been in the 1800s, uh, somewhere between a medieval guild and a club. So one of the things about these associations is they also functioned as mutual aid societies. One of the other kinds of associations or clubs Romans recognized were burial associations. It was a club whereby poor people could band together and effectively buy burial insurance for their members. And so you had an amount of money to buy in, and then you owed a certain monthly dues. We think of this as, you know, kind of weird, but I don't know if you've checked out funeral expenses. They're, they're like to die for. So the, um, sorry, that was, that was not premeditated, but it was deliberate. <laughs> um, the idea here is that um, Christian churches, yeah, Christian churches. We're done. Were, Let's head home. There you go. <laughs> Christian churches were often organized as burial associations. Yeah. Because they weren't a recognized religion, they had to fall under one of these other categories of clubs. And if they got recognized as a burial association, they could, in fact, bury their members according to whatever custom they wanted. Can I jump in again? Yeah. Because I read somewhere that uh, the, the two big things that uh, endeared the ancient world to the, to the Christians and huge things for evangelism was uh, rescuing babies that were exposed uh, Back then, if people didn't want a daughter, they uh, they didn't have the option of what we have now. But they would just after the birth, they would just put the the, the baby outside, expose it, and everybody knew if you heard a, a crying baby that those parents weren't keeping that baby, and it was normal accepted practice. Well, the Christians, yeah, I mean, or Jesus for that matter, but the Christians would go collect the exposed babies and they would raise them as their own. Yeah, there was this in the ancient world. Alex and I talked a little bit about this in the podcast. One of the things to keep in mind is how much risk the average person is exposed to in their daily life, right? You're always one sickness away or one injury away or one just somebody rich and powerful just doesn't like you away from disaster as a family, right? And it's very easy to lose status. It's very hard to gain status. One of the weird things about so people modern, have to look out for each other. Yeah, people have to and look out for each other. Of One of the things about these associations is they functioned as kind of a first line of social insurance, right? Joseph probably would have been a member of one of these as a carpenter in uh, Caesarea, where they or in Nazareth, where they were, were kind of located. The other thing I was going to mention is the, the Christians would bury the dead of other people. Yes, the Christians would set their burial insurance uh, thing apart from others is they would take you even if you weren't technically a Christian. And so this was a practice that was kind of weird because they were like, why would you go out of your way for other people, mm -hmm. um, particularly poor people? And this was a thing that early, the early church very much did. And it doesn't make sense to me because it's like once they're gone, the bodies, like I, I would think, what's, why is this such a big deal? But uh, apparently in the ancient world, uh, you're grieving, and, and you can't afford to bury, and so what are you going to do? You would have been just thrown into a pit, literally. Like, the burial custom for anybody that couldn't afford it was just mass grave, right? Yeah, and so here the Christians are giving dignity to your loved one. There's, uh, there, there's kind of an urban legend also that Christians met down in the catacombs. That was probably true for a very limited amount of time, only in Rome. Catacombs are nasty, and you don't want to go down there. And also, they're not very big. It's not like you can have a large meeting in a catacomb. Um, usually, Christian churches were organized as burial societies legally. Um, nobody here except possibly Alex and I are interested in the eccentricities of historical church organization. Um, but there you go. There you go. Uh, so I'll bet you there's one or two here that are. Maybe, maybe possibly. Dina, I think, yeah. 
we we have a separate class on how Presbyterianism arises from constitutional republicanism, but you know that's the whole other like class. Um, yeah, so these civic associations, um, very much you don't want to cross, and particularly if you're in a craft guild, you would have been barred from practicing a trade unless you were on the sort of allowed list of that craft association. So, like, Paul wasn't allowed to just go around making tents wherever he felt like it. He would have had to approach the tent makers in that city to say, okay, I'm going to pay the guild fee to join this particular association, pay the monthly dues, go to the meeting. Um, interestingly, these civic associations also had a requirement that you eat together at least once a month. Um, and so the early Christian practice of communion, as it was practiced in the first century, they all get together for a meal. And so that fit nicely into this Roman civic model. But again, the Romans all of a sudden have this widely distributed civic association as a very barrel society. They have a legal framework for it, but they're not quite sure that's really what it is, right? And so there's always this tension between legally the protection offered, offered Christians as a member of these associations to do what they wanted, but only within certain very uh, tightly prescribed limits, right? Okay. Any questions or comments? Further questions or comments about that stuff? Yeah, the comment is we're doing That's a great a job. Question, Thank you. I, hey, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. I'm good. <laughs> Dina. question and comment is about, um, what about the persecution under Domitian, who was a, a later Roman emperor? Uh, Domitian and Diocletian, so the Christians have been persecuted on and off, depending on what the whims of that particular emperor were. Nero was the first guy, but Nero was way too disorganized to really get organized about it. Uh, Trajan, um, Domitian, and there's another guy, Diocletian, I think, were really organized about it. But also, they had a lot more Christians to contend with by then, because Christianity had grown for another 60, 70 years. Yeah. Um, it's, in, it's interesting, the, uh, the book, one of the backstories of the book of Galatians, where Paul's wigging out about the early Gentile Christians uh, getting circumcised, the tension was the, the, the Gentile Christians were, suddenly they didn't want to offer worship to Caesar once a year, so they, they wanted to get in under the Jewish exemption yeah. so they wouldn't be killed. And so suddenly the, the, the actual uh, biological Jews, are they're like, you're not Jewish. Why are you trying to get in on our thing? And then the Roman uh, administrators would be like, well, wait a minute. Why is everybody, is this cheating? Or why are these non-Jewish people trying to get, get in on this exemption? And so there's a bunch of tension. One of the solutions was, was the Jewish believers would say, look, just get circumcised so we know you're Jewish and they know you're Jewish. Because if you mess this thing up for us, then, then we're going to get killed. The, there's a lot of backstory to the tension. It's not just a cultural thing. It's very much a legal thing as well. Um, and so they're trying to save their lives, and Paul is saying, right. you, you can't get circumcised just because they want to look good. Right. Because if you get circumcised, you're, you're missing the whole thing. And, and so it was this weird, but, but the, whole, the whole staying alive and the exemption was like the big cultural issue. There's, a, there's an interesting letter. So Pliny the Younger is the governor of Bithynia under, um, I forget which emperor he was under, very, very rich guy. And he writes this letter about this new thing he's uncovered in his province called Christianity. And he's like, well, if they're guilty of anything, they meet together, and then they swear up and down in this mutual oath not to do anything bad, and then they eat very conventional food, and then they leave. What am I supposed to prosecute, right? I mean, like, <laughs> he looks at this and he goes, like, clearly these people are not actually doing anything illegal. And what he gets back is, yeah, just wait, they'll go political at some point. 
So even there was a very much an awareness in the Roman statehood of the very fast downhill slope from organized religion into politics. And that was a thing the Romans really feared. Because remember, you don't live under a representative government. It's nominally a republic, but it isn't actually a republic, right? Well, the minute you don't burn incense to Caesar. And the minute you don't tow the party line, political. you are on somebody's list. Yeah. So they're not a good list, like for like presidents or something. <laughs> not a Santa Claus not list. A good, not a good Santa Claus All list. Right. So tell us about, uh, let's go to the hist- historical moment. So historical moment, uh, we are going to flip-flop. So we talked about the Y2K bug, a lot of fun. Unix week number rollover, 2038, set your clocks, uh, but not if they have Unix inside because they won't work. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the fall of Rome. And the more I kind of was looking back at my notes, um, the thing I really want to talk about is actually the sack of Rome. So in the year 410, Alaric, the Visigothic king, uh, leads an army of German barbarians uh, down to the gates of Rome, and they sack it. The Roman uh, uh, legions that are supposed to protect the city abandon them, or are defeated in battle, I think, further up the peninsula of Italy. Oh, at Goths? Goths would be uh, not the people with the, the spiky tattoos and the black nail polish. Goths, in this sense, literally means... Goths, a barbarian tribe from the other side of the Rhine in Germany. So they would be from effectively uh, outer Germany. Again, they had contact with the Romans for hundreds of years. They, so at that point, the Goths had converted to Christianity under Alaric. So Alaric, their king, is actually also a Christian. So one of the things is when the Goths get to Rome... They don't sack any churches, and they're not really supposed to sack any belongings belonging to any Christian. I don't know how much this is, like, polished up for the history books, but um, they do leave after three days. So they don't do a particularly thorough job of sacking the city. Um, Interestingly, the real sack of Rome is in 437, about 20 years later. The Vandals show up and do a way more thorough job because they're like, you guys clearly don't know how to sack a city. And the word Vandal actually comes from that tribe, the Vandals. The Vandals were also from Germany. So there's some sort of giant cave somewhere in Germany that produced the Franks, Burgundians, Goths, Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Vandals, like, you name it, they're all over. Anybody um, of German descent in the room? So this is this is us. That's us, yeah, man. This is right here, Scandinavians, we're, Germans, we're the right there. In, in this story. It's us. No, I, I don't literally mean a cave. I just mean that there's some infinite supply. There's some sort of source of barbarian tribes out in Germany somewhere. Yeah, well, what they want is they Germans want... have been causing trouble the whole time. Okay, so what they wanted was better I'm farmland, German, right? I can say that. So, me too. Um, <laughs> what they wanted was better farmland, right? And so when they come in, they're, they had already effectively married into the Roman system. But they're like, no, at this point, we'll just rule. Thanks, we're good. So... This causes in 410 an incredible shaking of the foundations of the faith of the Christians of the Western Roman Empire. Within weeks of the news of this spreading throughout, St. Augustine, who is currently was at that time a bishop in North Africa, has to basically get in his pulpit and go, the world is not going to end. So one of the things that's unique about this end of the world moment is there was a, a one of the greatest Christian scholars and theologians of all time, St. Augustine, who was about 50 by then and was a bishop, was on the scene ready to address this issue in real time, right? And he wrote his magnum opus, City of God, is a response to pagan critics who were like, see, Rome never would have gotten sacked if we just hadn't given up the old gods. Can I jump in again? Sure. So, um, Everybody knows that Revelation is, is speaking indirectly about the Roman Empire. The question is, is what else is it speaking about? And is there further interpretations beyond that? Uh, the, the dragon on the seven hills, Rome is known as the city on the seven hills. And they're the beasts, they're, they're the problem. They're the ones persecuting the church. They're the issue. And so, um, and, 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 and that's generally understood. It's just a question of how do we apply that to today. But... Um, Hey, Paul. But uh, imagine being a Christian, and, and, and you're reading prophecy about the fall of, of the state, of the center of the world. The Roman Empire is, the, they are in. The eternal city. They're, yeah, they, they are the problem. 
and and then uh, Rome. Uh, several centuries go by, and Rome starts be, turning into a Christian empire be, from sheer numbers, like like over fifty percent of the empire by the three hundreds, and it's starting in the cities and then going out into the countryside. And so, uh, and so over those centuries, people begin to change their view of Rome as not the Antichrist or the Beast, but as as God's kingdom. And now there's a merging of this idea that the kingdom of God is Rome. After all, the emperors became Romans, I mean, became Christians. And, and now it's, it, you can see it. The kingdom of God was sort of hard to see prior to that. Uh, it was more nebulous. And, and over that period of time, Rome has gone from being the beast to being, uh, to being actually the church or the visible manifestation of the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. And so you cannot separate the Rome, you cannot, now, now you can't separate Rome from the kingdom of God, where before it was like, how can we survive because of these guys? And so now Rome falls, and it's just so bizarre to me. All the Christians are freaking out because they think Christianity has ended because Rome is ended. Well, and they think the end of the world has come, right? I mean, this is the, I mean, if you're, if you're looking for a good end of the world prophecy, uh, the fall of Rome is about as clearly a triggering like event as you can get. And Augustine comes into this, and he says, you've forgotten the basic thing, that you're not citizens of this world first. You're citizens of heaven, and the Roman Empire is not required for the purposes of God. Well, it takes him over a thousand pages to make this argument. City of God is a really, really long book, and he writes it over a period of of over a decade, because the argument is so tempting to identify and conflate those two. So in all of these end-of-the-world moments, I've been talking a little bit about an error that the people of that time fell into, right? The error here is overfitting uh, based on your own country, right? It's thinking that your country somehow is so central to the purposes of God and to the plans of God that the plans of God will, in fact, be derailed or caused by what happens to your country. Now, I'm not saying countries aren't important. I'm not advocating against patriotism. Let nobody misunderstand. But you got to, what Augustine is arguing in City of God very strongly is that you got to look at it from the heavenly perspective. And the purposes of God are completely capable of surviving the downfall of one country, right? I will leave it as an exercise to the reader to see where else in your lives you wish to apply this or what other <laughs> countries you wish to you wish to think about as a uh, overfitting problem. Sure, the comment is surely not us. Um, right. I, no comment, actually. So, well, let me just uh, use the easy example uh, in Germany in the in the twentieth century, uh, and for quite a few years before that, the church and the state were, uh, were were completely combined. The Lutheran Church was a state-run church, and so in the it still mines, is actually okay. And and Luther was their guy. L- Luther was their. It already, the church and state had been so merged even before the Reformation. But so for Germans, the state and the church uh, always had to had to partner. So when a, a psychopath like Hitler comes to power, then there's there's like a um, there's a problem because we have to be loyal to the state because we've been raised that the state and the church are paired together and that you can't separate those loyalties. And that's a big reason why much of the state went along with, with the psychosis of Nazism and only a few people stood up against it because their, their understanding of how uh, the kingdom of God works was inextricably linked to state at that time. And, and it was not helpful. We, we should mention that this error has happened in a lot of other countries. It's not just, we don't mean to pick on Germans. So England's another great England, example. England, in fact, has the head of government nominally. Well, the head of the state is also the head of the church which is uh, not actually the Bishop of Canterbury or Archbishop of Canterbury. It's actually Charles, it's King, King yeah, Charles. King Charles. It would be nice if King Charles was actually a Christian. Uh, I, I'm not going to comment on somebody else's yeah, service. Like not but, my, not my the job. In the 1800s, England's uh, conquering the world and, and bringing Christianity mm-hmm. to the third world, but they're conquering them while they're doing it. And in the mind of the average British, British person in the 1800s, without question, the state and the church were the same thing, two arms of the same thing, and they were doing God's will. But unfortunately, a lot, a lot of natives in the Sudan didn't really get that. I, there understand. were a lot of people that I think were less, less than appreciative of the yeah. efforts of So it's, it, uh, it is a common problem. And I think most states that have a lot of Christians and where the state has embraced Christianity at some level, then patriotism and, and, uh, and God uh, become merged. 
It's interesting. We were talking about this the other day. I apologize. I know this is your segment. No, no, go ahead. I'm getting all excited. It's our segment. Okay. It's, it's nice of you. Um, uh, first Christian emperor, Constantine, right? Now, that he killed a lot of people to become the emperor. And in the process of killing those people, he became a Christian. He got a vision from God where uh, as you go kill, kill, defeat the other army, here's a sign of a cross. And actually, the sign of the cross was a blending of a cross and a state symbol. Anyway, so Constantine, uh, he gives himself to Jesus. Uh, apparently, salvation's a process for people, but he knew that if he fully embraced uh, this, the Messiah, that he could not uh, effectively run the empire. Because you cannot run the Roman Empire as a Christian. You will be killed very fast, you know. This is in uh, early 300s. Yeah, 312. So, um, so you know what Constantine did? Uh, since he knew there was a conflict, he, he, uh, he chose not to get baptized until his deathbed. Because he, he knew that if he got baptized, that, that there would be an expectation that he would live this thing in every part of his life. And so he saw the blending of church and state in that case as incompatible. And so he, he waited until the end. Uh, and and I, feel, I feel kind of bad for the guy because you, you get this revelation of Jesus and then you have a job that involves a lot of butchery. And what do you do at that point? Well, he went. He was meant. He was discipled by a, a bishop in, uh, who, from Spain, and 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 the bishop talked to him about. I mean, he, he was a candidate for baptism, and they didn't say, "Well, you can skip the class." It wasn't like now where you show up and. and it, it's still not like that. As somebody that's looked at RSA, like it's it's still not like that. You back in those days, if you were going to become a Christian, you, you had to. <laughs> There's still a class. Yeah, it was a it was you. Constantine couldn't become a nominal Christian. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so he he recognized that, and uh, and it, maybe it was the, the advice of his bishop. He goes, I can't live this life right now. He was just like, well, uh, when you can, let me know. And you know, and and he did a lot of bloody stuff while he was. So uh, that was the end of the world moment. Right. So, any questions or comments about that? Talk, talk about it. When, do, do you have uh, the the comment is super conflicting? Do you have an empire to run? Is that the or what? The, sorry. sorry, I'm giving you a hard time. <laughs> and I'm the one with the mic. I shouldn't do that. I'm sorry. The question is, is running an empire and going to war incompatible with the Christian faith? I don't believe they're I don't believe they're incompatible, but I believe that a strong teaching of the Bible is that you always have to check your methods with your ends, right? The ends do not justify the means. That's a very basic teaching and it is very fast to be forgotten when you're running an empire. Right? There's a question of a, of a just war. The, the Pope's actually declared Ukraine a just war at the moment. So there, there is. I. Maybe the. Uh, we, maybe the yeah, the, executive the, in chief. Yeah. The the comment is yeah we have a lot of Christians in office. I I agree. I don't think these are fundamentally incompatible. Keep in mind that Constantine is running not a industrialized democracy, but a a violent a, a, a autocracy, military dictator. autocracy. Yeah. Right? It's it's a very different environment. It's like running the Klingon Empire. Basically. I'm also not endorsing you, his choice. Yeah, it's much more like being a Klingon. You gotta, you, you gotta kill or be killed. Kapla! People are trying to assassinate you all the time. Serena, did you finish your comment? Because you just started, or was that the gist of it? Can be a process, or yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, Constantine clearly is not a model for how you should pursue your discipleship uh, experience. I, I agree with um, you completely, and and I think and it's sad that he. I mean, I think when he he chose his job over his calling, perhaps somehow we saw the two as incompatible, and, and he wasn't able to put Christ first in, in, in that situation. So, was he really a Christian? Was he really the first Christian emperor? Emperor. He was the first one that, that uh, 
but the confessed Christ. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that too. He had a praying mom. And uh, imagine being the praying mother of the, the next emperor. Ironically, uh, Augustine actually also had a praying mom. Yeah. So St. Monica, uh, mother of St. Augustine. Yep. So, so praying, praying moms were a big deal in the early 300s um, in Rome. Well, the moms were. Augustine's later, but yeah. yeah. But um, It's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I would, and, and poor Augustine's mom, he was just a wild man. Augustine was a bit of a mess. He wrote an entire <laughs> book about it called uh, Confessions. <laughs> it's good reading. It's yeah, he, he had a lot of sex with a lot he, of people. Um, he was not living a righteous life. And for him, it was very much an all or nothing thing where yeah. he looked at that and he felt very clearly God was calling him to celibacy. Like serious celibacy. Yeah. Like you're done. In his case, he needed to be And I, he, uh, um, Augustine wrote a, one of the first true biographies, autobiographies in all of what you know the canon of world literature is St. Augustine's Confessions. Um, and he was an amazingly good writer and yeah, well, we hope to meet him up in heaven someday and go, yo, right yeah. on, good work. Um, I didn't make it through all of City of God though because it's really, really long. I haven't read any of this stuff. It's like 1,100 pages in English. I own both of those. I don't know how he got that much papyrus or whatever. But, Has yeah. anyone read Confessions or City of God? I've read Confessions, yeah. Oh, you did? It's quite good. I had a college class on it. Wow. Okay. Any other questions or comments about this? So. Yeah, I think Priscilla and Aquila. Yeah, Priscilla and Aquila were also tent makers, and that's how they would have given. That that's how Paul met them, probably at the Civic Association while he was trying to get a day job lined up for his uh, time. I think at Ephesus, but it might have been Corinth. I don't forget which one. Okay, good. But yeah. Guilds, uh, guilds or trade associations, yeah. There, there were four, four legally recognized ones. Um, uh, the question is, what were the four associations? Because I kind of got sidetracked on three. Um, trade is the big kind. Religion is the second big kind. Uh, um, burial associations or mutual aid societies, they, they also would have functioned as kind of a mutual aid society. In fact, they actually still have this in a lot of developing economies. Um, the fourth one is what's called a household association. And it's kind of like a club for everybody that works for a powerful patron. And they were recognized as like a way of kind of banding together. That one's actually the most like a union because all of you have the same boss. Um, so household associations would have been made up of anybody who had a common powerful patron. But they would have also been sponsored by that patron and expected to meet in their house. So it was kind of like another one of these clubs. We don't really have an analog to that because, like, if you're a rich person, like, there's not a Bill Gates fan club that meets in his house. Like, it's just not a thing we, we kind of do anymore. Hey, maybe Elon has one. I don't know. If anybody has one, it's going to be him. So, <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, that's kind of the, okay. the idea of a household association, which is the fourth one. All right. That was good. Thank you, Matthew. All right, so um, let's get into uh, Revelation 15 and 16. So turn to page uh, 22, and I'm going to just talk and comment and uh, uh, jump in with questions. You might have to wave your hand or, or shout. Um, we also, I want to mention also before the, the we read this one, the book is still weird, right? We're definitely still in the weird portion of the book, and it's a lot of symbology, and I think well, one point you turned to me in the podcast and go, all right, we read this thing. What does it mean? And I looked at you <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I don't know what this means. Like this chapter is hard. I don't quite know what it means. So we're going to go with that caveat in there that we're still in the section of the book where I don't know what it means. I mean, if I, if I told you for sure it definitely means this, then I probably have a little more confidence than is warranted in my own scholarly abilities. <laughs> so. Okay, so in a nutshell, um, this, uh, this, uh, from the progressive parallelism approach, this is defined as another segment. 
So it's again, it's one of the seven retellings of the whole story of um, of the people of God and spiritual warfare um, from front to finish. The first part of this section, I'm going to do big macro, uh, shows the people of God again, and this is the third time I think that we've seen them. Um, uh, and so now we're seeing them again. It's the opening of another section uh, potentially, and so that's awesome. And we'll get into that in a moment. And then. Uh, that's chapter 15, uh, most, the first part of chapter 15. And then the last part in chapter 16 is the bowls of wrath being poured out. And so we have a contrast between the people of God who are in a secure place, and then we have the unrepentant who are uh, having stuff poured on them uh, from heaven, is how, is how it's expressed, for the purpose of repentance. And so... Uh, one of the questions I want to ask at the beginning is um, uh, we, we opened this class with uh, an overview, a very fast overview of, of the four historical views of how to interpret Revelation. Um, three of the four, uh, the first three, uh, see this stuff as currently happening with a future greater fulfillment. The fourth view, which is the most common view that we're used to, um, dispensational premillennialism, the Lake Great Planet Earth, uh, Left Behind series, uh, sees this all as future stuff. And so it doesn't apply to us. It's like when the tribulation happens, then all this stuff starts happening. So I'm always trying to, uh, uh, to uh, I guess, go against the grain a little bit. And, and it's how I've learned to read and enjoy Revelation is how is this stuff playing out currently? Or are the images so fantastic that we cannot view it as currently happening? So if, if we take a, a very literalist approach toward this, uh, I mean, have have there been hundred pound hailstones fall on the earth? Uh, definitely from volcanic explosions, yeah. But I don't yeah. know how widespread that Generally is. Generally speaking, no. But not a not a common occurrence. No. Yeah. So you really have to embrace uh, sim symbol uh, versus code. Uh, that these things have uh, uh, have uh, wider meanings, and I and that they can be applied to current circumstances. So that's that's the theory, whether it's right or wrong. Um, and so I want to I want to challenge us to look at this section uh, from that standpoint. Um, and and uh, site. Yeah, the the comment is drinking the blood is not literal. Yeah, let's, that's, let's hope not. That's the idea. Or or the uh, the grapes of wrath are not actually grapes. We, we should put in a plug for our state since this is going out to the internet. Like we're in Colorado, and if anybody's going to get hit by hundred pound hailstones, it's going to be here. So. <laughs> This place has the biggest hail of any place I've ever lived yeah. or heard of. It's insane. Well, it's the biggest hailstone I saw was the size of a tennis ball. Yeah, they're they're they grow them big here. And you don't want to get hit in the head with that no. thing. That's for sure. Those wind, wind, windshield breaking. All right, um, let's jump in. Uh, Fifteen, verse one. I saw heaven. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Uh, pause there. Uh, what have we learned about heaven here recently? It's here. And it's not, in, not just in the future, and it's not in a faraway place. It's here. Uh, the word for heaven in the Greek is also the same word as air. Okay? So uh, in John's mind, um, when he says he sees in heaven, um, we're not picturing him with his head tilted back, and he sees something way, way, way up in the clouds. Uh, a, a, better, a better way to approach it is he's seeing it superimposed on where we are. So uh, that's uh, we don't actually know that, but that fits um, the, that fits the Jewish view of, of heaven in the heavens. So actually, we we pretty much do know that. So he sees a, a, another sign in heaven: uh, seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last, because with them, God's wrath is completed. And I'll pause there for a second. Thank God. I mean, this is going to be rough, but thank God that there's a completion point. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast in his image and over the number of his name. Um, so this is the description. It's very brief of the, the people we saw in Revelation 7. Uh, there they're waving palm branches and wearing white robes, and they're all martyrs. The next place we see it, which I think is in chapter um, 14, I think I think we see not specifically they're they're marked they're, they're marked off by the Lord, but it's not. They, they have the it. stone and the seal, but it's unclear what, what what that means. Yeah, that may have been like a passport kind of a deal. 
in the uh, second look at these folks, which I think is in 11. The, the key thing here in the image is they are separate and distinct. That God has pulled apart two different peoples, that they're not all in the same place. Interestingly, they're also on the seashore, which is the very spot the beast makes them stand. Mm -hmm. So they're standing literally in the spot where the beast just yep. was one chapter ago. If there's a battle happening now, everyone is right next to each other doing it. That's, that's the question, and what I can tell you is my understanding is those are representative of the people of God throughout time. You should repeat the question. Sorry, uh, 144,000, is it uh, Jewish people, is it in the future? When are, are they living or dead? That's the other... Yeah, uh, I think it's figurative, uh, uh, but the figure uh, speaks to something that's literal here and now. So the way I would understand that, and there's three or four reasons why, is, is the 12 times 12 times 1,000 is the Old Testament people of God, the 12 patriarchs, the New Testament people of God, the 12 apostles, times infinity, which in, in the book of Revelation is 1,000. And so, and the fact, and, and, and it includes Jews and Gentiles because one of the descriptions uh, in, in chapter 11 going into 12 defines these as people that have embraced Jesus Christ, not just the law. So I would say that they're the people of God. They're us. We're the 144,000. Yeah. Yes. And we are. Well, or, or where are we going to find from those, the 12 tribes mentioned? Because uh, some people can trace their lineage to Judah and Benjamin, but for the most part, the diaspora, it's it's a blur. So and that's part of why I think it's it's a, it's a, a symbol of the people of God. And also, there's a, the curiosity that um, uh, um, Dan has left out. And uh, so there's things that make it seem like it's not actually trying to precisely say it has to be these people. But that's that's the point of interpretation. We, so, we should also mention the question is, where are we going to find that many uh, pure, undefiled people? And the answer is the same way we, we find Christians, right? God makes good. them pure, right? Yeah. One of the messages that should be very, very clear is that the blood of the lamb is what does the cleansing. Like it's always the redemptive work. This, the author of your salvation is on the divine side, not on the human side, right? So that's very clear as a message in this and very consistent yeah. with the rest of our well, New Testament. One teaching. of the reasons to think maybe it's not us is because the first group is martyrs and we're still alive. The second group is virgins. And maybe there's a virgin or two in this room. I don't know. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands. Um, if you're married, you're not a virgin. Uh, those who have never told, who uh, never lie, and then now we have apparently the same group uh, with with the fourth descriptor as being victorious over the beast. So if we view these as the same people, then they're people who, because of the work on the cross, uh, are are pure in in their uh, they've given their lives to Jesus. So in that sense, they're martyrs. They are they're sexually pure in how they conduct themselves, or in the process of doing that. I think for all of us, it's a process. Sanctification is becoming what we already are. There's actually a verse that says they've been sanctified by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Yeah. And that's like the thing, right? I mean, God does his thing, yes. but we also have a part to play in that, stepping into that, that yeah. gift, right? And, and Constantine was very passive in his part. Because he, he had he's glad he got in. So. There's a verse in Colossians 3 that talks about the, two, the, the us that are two of us. The, the dead us... Uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, uh, you've died, uh, and, and your real life is uh, is being revealed as Christ is being revealed. Yeah. So when I read Paul in verses like that, I think of the real us as being like these descriptors of the 144,000. This is who we actually are and who we're becoming. And even though, um, you know, uh, of those four descriptors, I probably didn't measure up to all four of those even today somehow, right? But the thing is, that's, that's the permanent Alex... Uh, with Christ in heaven being revealed as Christ is being revealed is in fact these things. He, he's, he's the description of the completed saint that, 
that, and it's a beautiful thing, and that's who we currently are, and it's who we become. Sorry. So the question is, does the 144,000 come down and preach to the Jews? What's the deal with the 144,000? I think in the context where that that particular number only shows up in that one view, and I think the rest of the book makes it clear that it's the same group of people, but for some reason these 144,000 are separated out. And I don't know what's special about them in the symbology of what John is seeing. The thing that the early church would have understood is, there's a mess of them. There's a lot of us. They wouldn't have felt alone because they, they would have recognized that as a part. The other thing they would have known is, oh, Judaism still has a part to play in the plans of God, right? And so there was this idea going around that somehow, like, we can just jettison all that stuff as well. And, you know, even in the experience of modern Christianity, we got deep Jewish roots, right? I mean, we still revere the Torah as the revealed word of God, as do our, our Jewish brothers and sisters, right? So the thing about that 144,000 and about the tribes that it's mentioned is that God has a lot of different ways to get people into the kingdom. And one of the things that's true about that is the thing that keeps coming back in that theme is the idea of completeness, right? John talks about the complete number being filled from each of these sort of ideas or these, you know, tribes. And the idea is God isn't losing people, right? He's going to get, all, he, if, if you're in that thing God wants to call you into, he's going to see that work to completion, right? The idea that well, gonna, In terms of what the actual, like, d duties and obligations are, no idea. I don't know what the uniform looks yeah. like. That part I couldn't tell you. And I, I have, I probably have more opinions, more distinct opinions than, what? You, than you do. Uh, which doesn't mean that I'm right, but we should we should talk bowls also before we get too far. <laughs> okay. Sure. Yeah. So I, I know where you're going with this, which is what about the, it talks about the names being inscribed in the book of life since before the dawn of time. Ooh. So welcome to predestination versus uh, our Arminianism. Um, yeah. Let's, let's stay in Revelation. Let's, let's, hey, let's talk wrath of God instead. Yeah. That, <laughs> dealing with wrath of God might actually be easier. <laughs> Cognitively. <laughs> I don't want Having been raised Presbyterian, but also you yeah. know, being a good Reformed theologian you, by training. You feel a duty to, to uh, protect uh, predestination. Oh, I don't feel any duty at all to protect predestination at all. Lousy Presbyterian. I'm, I'm a lousy Presbyterian. Yeah. Um, all right. So I, I, lo I love all these questions because these these are like the questions, and I wanted to rant more about the 144, but okay. I, think, I think but but I won't because otherwise we won't get anywhere. We can maybe talk later if you want. So go ahead. that because that's a great segue to these two chapters. Yes. Because we, we see the people of God, whoever they are, in the beginning, and then we and then now we're going to get to the plagues that are poured out on the earth to the rest of the group. And if we and if we view this section from through the eyes of a, a loving God who doesn't want anyone to perish, th then I think I think that's the perspective that we want. That God's not just ticked off and flinging stuff at people, but but the point is to uh, he wants to give us the gift of repentance, which is kindness that we just did. Rod, we're not going there. <laughs> we're, not, we're not going there, Rod. No, no, we can talk later because I, I thought a lot about this. The, the question is about predestination, selection, free will. How does this all work? I think that's where you're headed. Is that That'll be headed? our next class, okay. Calvinism versus excellent, Arminianism. Excellent idea. Um, <laughs> that, yeah, that yeah if we didn't idea. lose you with Hal Lindsey, we'll, we'll spend, definitely lose we'll you talking about predestination weeks versus on that. free will. Um, if we, He'll we'll, talk to you about it later. 
I was he's saying got, he's got opinions on that subject. I was saying if we didn't lose him with Hal Lindsey, we'll definitely lose him with predestination versus free will. So or or win him. I or, or well, well. Although you're not the person to to defend this. If I, I'm I'm really not. All right. So um, uh, these people uh, who are victorious uh, uh, because they didn't they didn't take the image of the beast, and uh, and now they're holding harps. And I think this is where we get some of the classic views of heaven. Uh, given to them by God, and they're singing a song, uh, God's the song of God's servant Moses and the Lamb, which is interesting because you can compare the song they're going to sing to the song of Moses and Miriam after the plagues in Egypt and the uh, crossing of the Red Sea. So there's definitely a parallel here between God's, God's deliverance uh, is throughout all of Scripture. He delivers us from evil, uh, and there's songs of victory in it, and there's hardship for those who are uh, hard-hearted and unrepentant toward the Lord. Um, it's interesting in this in their song. Uh, there's a line that says, "All the nations will come and worship before you." And uh, I've been pondering that this week uh, because obviously, well, I guess the question is, and this is similar to like uh, the, the ancient poem in, in uh, uh, Philippians chapter two. Uh, Jesus has been elevated; every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And we, we tend to view that as uh, everybody, even though they they're not actually worshiping in their heart and they have no intention of, of bowing or giving allegiance to Jesus, that they're being forced to at that moment, right? And, and that's generally how we view these scriptures. Even here, all the nations will come and worship. Either it's metaphorical, like a lot of them will. Uh, almost like, you know, when, when uh, Paul says, uh, and all Israel will be saved, is that metaphorical or is that, is that literal? But, um, uh, and I lost my train of thought. I was just feeling so inspired for a minute there. All right. Um. Yeah, I really did. Sorry, everybody. I felt like I was going somewhere. Where was I going with that? Um, the question is, so the, the issue that we're going to get into in about two minutes is the wrath of God is being poured out. Why? What's the function of just smiting the earth for no good reason? Obviously, God has a good reason. What's the reason? This is a thing that I wrestle, Alex wrestle, everybody who reads this goes, wow, it's kind of heavy. Um, barring, you know, some people who maybe think this is awesome, like, I don't think it's awesome. I think this is terrifying, right? And so the question is... How is this helpful? Right. What's, what's the point? I mean, is the point just to increase the amount of suffering in the world? To what end, right? Um and the question I was trying to get to is, if all the nations do worship and every knee does bow... How, how do we get from point A to point B? Well, are they doing... Is it actual worship where people are, are literally bowing to... Is, is, is it worship if they're not worshiping? And if is it, is it submission to Jesus if they're not submitting? And so I, I, I think we should, we should move beyond just saying, yeah, this is when everyone's forced to submit to God whether they want to or not. And, and, and perhaps view it through the idea that, that this is the end, this is the, the intended end is, I will is say for everybody to worship, actually yeah. worship from their hearts. And one of the things that's very clear if you move into Revelation 16 in the next chapter is John himself is shocked observing this, that people don't repent. He's like, there was this bull, and it was terrible. And then you won't believe it, but they didn't repent. And so John himself, as an external observer, is watching this going, when are they going to get it? Like, why aren't they getting it? So John clearly believes there's some therapeutic purpose to yeah. all of this wrath. Um, and he says, because his, his refrain throughout all this as it's observing is, and then, I don't know why, but they just didn't give glory to God. Like, yeah. And so, I think, I'm sorry, what? Pharaoh. Yeah, it very much, the comment is it recalls the story of Pharaoh. Yes, very much so. It very much echoes of Pharaoh. And, and it brings up the bigger question. They're singing the song of Moses right there, so. S similar. I don't know about that. I don't know about worships. I, I know he acknowledged it. Yeah, the, the other, other rabbit hole, great. I yeah, so the other... The thing you're bringing up, uh, the comment, um, the comment uh, Michael brought up is this story also has a lot in common with the story of Job, where there's suffering and Job goes, "I don't get it. I don't get it." Yeah. So as I read the as I read the bowls of wrath, 
uh, I would encourage you to think about this as, as we're the people by the glass sea and we're side by side with, with the unrepentant in the world and we're, we're watching the suffering of humanity around us and, and, and we're praying because some of the people, the unrepentant people are our family members, okay? Uh, uh, unless you just really did well with your family. And so I, I want us to look at it kind of like through the eyes that Ellen gave, that, uh, that God's whole purpose of these bowls is, is to uh, give the gift of repentance. And I don't know about you, but I, I could say that it was a bowl of wrath that gave me the impetus uh, and the desire to give myself to God. And, uh, and the relief that I received when I did that it makes me very much feel like these people holding their hearts and, 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 and thankfully praising God. So that's sort of a context I want to give as we read these things. Rather than, yeah, they're getting theirs, God sticked. Uh, at least it's finally going to happen. Do you, want, do you want to mention, so super briefly also, in the Hendrickson book, one of the points he makes very clear is that the bowls of wrath are also the trumpets, are also the seals, right? That idea of that seven... And so is a thing a bowl of wrath or is it a trumpet? Well, it depends on how you look at it, right? But what Hendrickson's theory is, is that these are the same things coming back as symbols, sometimes of wrath, sometimes of warning, sometimes as directives. The seven bowls line up very, very cleanly with the seven trumpets and the seven seals. And we... we yeah, Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar... Same, yeah, same the, conclusion. <laughs> yeah, same with Pharaoh. Same with Pharaoh as well. Uh, on page 40 um, in your booklet, um, it, it lists out, you can particularly see it with the seals, trumpets, and the bowls. The progression of the things that are poured out are, are, are line up perfectly with the progression of the trumpets and the seals. So they're the same things in increasing measure. So it's clear that there's a reason for that. And, and again, you can, you can decide that Hendrickson is wrong and look at it your own way too if you find more sort of comfort in that. He, he's researched it a lot, so I'm kind well, of inclined to agree with even if you're Even if you're not his particular brand, everybody recognizes that this next series it, it is a repeating pattern of the previous series. Whatever, so it's like coming in again for the third chorus in the song. Yeah, and it just worse. <laughs> third verse, louder than the, worse louder than the first. A little bit louder and a little, a little bit worse. worse. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Richard. Yes, there's a few typos in that. All right, here we go. I heard a loud voice, from the chapter 16, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Here we go. First angel went and poured out his bowl on the land. The ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Uh, what, they're, what they're thinking in their heads or what they're doing with their hands. That's me. That's not the text. Verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. It turned to blood like that of a dead person, and every living thing in the sea died. And the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard an angel in charge of the waters say, and now we're going to have a little interlude. So three bowls, and then there's a pause. And the angels basically are singing, yeah, this is fair, this is just, this is right. And then heaven, another part of heaven echoes and says, yeah, your, your judgments are true and they're just. Uh, just. Uh, fourth, and now there's a distinction. The first three are bad and now they're going to amplify. Fourth angel poured out his bowl, uh, verse 8, on the sun. Uh, the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify. Uh, it says they refused to repent. That's the first uh, the plagues four through seven finished with that ref refrain. God does this, they refuse to repent. Fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And by the way, this is good news for these folks. It's like that throne is getting poured out on. See, these guys who are killing us, God's pouring it out on them finally. Uh, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Sixth angel poured out 
his bull on the great river Euphrates. Uh, that happens also with the sixth uh, trumpet, by the way. Uh, its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So the sixth one is this thing is getting closer and closer to its big end. Now it's, it's, it's like preparing the way for war. And so in, in ancient Israel, um, if, you, if, if God's judgment was coming from any particular direction to wreak havoc on your country, whether it was the Syrians first or whether it was the, or the, the, or the Babylonians second, they came from the east. And so there's this idea that when, those, when these guys crossed the Euphrates, um, we're in trouble. We, we should mention the reason they come from the east is that's how the geography works out. Yeah. Like that's where the mountain pass is, so that's why they always come that way. Yeah. Well, and they are to the east. Yes. Right. Oh, the reason they, the enemies always come from the east is that's the way the geography works out. Armageddon is a real place, like the Valley of Megiddo, and it's because that's where the mountain pass is. So if you're going to invade a place, like park your army in the mountain pass, it's like kind of like tactics 101. Come through that way. Like yeah, the, come, the through, come through that way. In Afghanistan or something. Gog and Magog, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, right. the, the comment is when uh, Jeff was growing up, the reference to the East was always the empire of Russia. It, it might be again. <laughs> well, we're, we're always looking for the biggest, baddest threat, um, and Russia was clearly it in the 70s. And, and uh, you know, in, if in the early 1800s, it was clearly Napoleon, but he, he never came from the East. And the Russians are going to come from the North, right, if you're in Israel. Yeah. yeah, we could we could have a lot of different empires. That would be fun. Yeah, but at, terrible. At, at any rate, this is this image of now uh, the uh, the kings of the earth are tired of all these bulls, and now they're coming to fight. And, and this is the however you interpret this, this is a description of the big end. The big end is coming. And <laughs> then I saw I like this part. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. These are the big three, right? This is the anti-Trinity. Instead of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we got the frog dragon. one, two, and three, right? Yeah, and they have frogs coming out of their mouth, and um, and the, uh, the these are demonic spirits that perform signs. They go out to the kings of the whole world, gathering them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. I, on a side note, um, I like to do uh, help people with uh, with deliverance stuff, helping people. Uh, get freedom from uh, demonic oppression, uh, demonic attachments. Um, we did a deliverance for somebody one time, and uh, they had a frog coming out of them. And um, this person decided they didn't want, didn't want a deliverance because they weren't sure they wanted to commit to Jesus. And they said, I, I'm afraid it doesn't, I'm not aware of it working any other way. And, um, and then they said, well, go ahead. Now, they were very suicidal and trying to stay alive. Uh, we start to pray. Um, one of the helpers says, I see a frog coming out of your stomach. And the recipient says, yeah, that thing's been there for a long time. And, well, do you, uh, if you want to be free from suicide, you probably can't coexist with this frog thing inside of you. So do you want to get rid of it? <sighs> yeah, I guess so. Well, if you're going to get rid of it, uh, you're going to have to take the plunge in with Jesus. So it's a, but you have to do that. Okay, I'll do it. And so uh, this frog thing came out. And, um, and and that person hasn't dealt with suicide since then. So I think of, uh, of uh, when I hear of demon frogs coming out of the, out of the big three, that's, that's, that's the first thing I thought of. All right, look. Uh, dragon, beast one, and then the false beast prophet. Two. And yeah. Beast two, which is the false prophet. Yeah. All right. Um, we should mention real frogs are awesome because they're a good indicator species. So, but we're that's yeah. a different thing. Not actual frogs. Frogs are cute. Real frogs are cute. In verse fifteen. Look, uh, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed. Um, being clothed in Christ, and, and actually, you talked about clothing. Clothing is really awake. important. Yep. That's a good example of that. I like Galatians three, where Paul says that anyone who's in Christ is clothed uh, with Christ. Anyone who's been baptized is clothed with Christ. So. So not to go naked and shamefully exposed. Interesting metaphor. 
Then, and here it is, the big end, verse 16, and they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon, uh, which in Hebrew is Har Magadon. It's actually, uh, there was a major battle. Uh, there have been a bunch of major battles there. The first one that we know of was from the kings of the east is in Judges 4 and 5. It's when Deborah is leading the nation, and um, and um, they defeat the, the uh, armies of, of Jabin. The question is, who's saying, look, I come like a thief in verse 15? I'm always, that's coming from heaven, whether it's, uh, whether it's the voice of, of, of the Father or the Son or one of the angels. Somebody, if you can help with that, I, I, I'm not sure where, who else is speaking in this chapter. Would, would probably be the well, at one point, the altar starts speaking, too. Yeah. So Exactly. Angels, altar. Could be come from a lot of places. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm assuming it's Jesus. That's how I've always interpreted it. Yeah. He, he, Jesus certainly says something a lot like that, and I'm seeing as how John was his best friend on earth. Like it, yeah, yeah. It seems, seems reasonable. Does Jesus say, I'll come like a thief in the night? In, yeah, he in does. One of the, uh, he does in the first. Matthew first well, he also does in the first part of this. In the first three chapters, he gives one of the things he says to the thing is like, you know, I'm, I'm okay. coming. All right. Uh, seventh. And now here's the seventh. The seventh bowl is actually uh, the consequence of the battle. So the seventh bowl is the result of the king's gathering in the big war. Seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. Uh, so now it's pretty much you can't breathe without that. And I love this. Out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. Uh, which to me echoes of the last words of Jesus, even though they're, they're not exactly the same. Uh, flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on the earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city, which we're going to get into next week. Next week is a, a very, very detailed description of, of, uh, of Babylon. Uh, Metaphorical Babylon. But yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Uh, most people think it's, it's the latest name for uh, uh, Rome is the latest iteration of Babylon. But uh, and so next week will be fun. Uh, we get into the detail of this battle. More fun than the wrath. <laughs> it's more. Inter- it's more inter- it's, Yeah, whatever. I, the special effects are I'm probably not supposed more to interesting. Like it, I know. I yeah, the special effects are I think better this week. But the yeah. great city split. The great city split into three parts, uh, which is uh, uh, fitting since the three-part Trinity is uh, destroying it, and the the anti-Trinity, the three that we keep talking about. Uh, what we'll find out in the next two chapters is they actually turn in on, on themselves and they turn against themselves. And that's interesting how evil always eventually uh, consumes itself. And that's what happens here. It splits into three parts. Cities of the nations collapsed. Uh, God, remember Babylon the Great, gave her, gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Uh, lots of shades of Isaiah. Every mountain Every island fled. The mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on the people, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. So it's, it seems pretty terrible. Somebody is still, and if this is a process of of, of spiritual warfare, and and the question of whether people will remain as unrepentant, because we know in our world that people do repent and they come into uh, the people of God. Uh, and, and this isn't saying, uh, it says they continue not to repent. And I, I can't help but wonder if that continually non-repenting group is actually getting smaller and smaller while the halls of heaven are filling up uh, greater and greater. Eventually that city, that limitless city is going to be full. So, Except that he wasn't talking about heaven in Matthew 7, which is a... Yeah, without question... Yeah, Ellen is making the point that the... Yeah, Ellen's making the point for uh, posterity that um, wide is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the road that leads to salvation. At least to life. You certainly to life. You certainly. The question is, are we actually talking about heaven? Right. And and that's the standard interpretation of Jesus's words toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount. But. <sighs> all, all I'm going to 
to say, all I'm going to say is sometimes we apply a lot of verses to who's, how many people are going to get saved. And, and I, and, and, and I, There has to be an urgency to live the life in order to set our brothers and sisters free, and and they don't, and, and, and many will not choose. And and but um, but but I think a lot of the verses we apply to who's going to heaven or not uh, are are are, uh, are open to interpretation. And, and I know people are going to hell, and I believe in hell. But uh, one of the, the the market things that I'm and we just taught in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and I, and, I'll, and we need to wrap up here. So I just wanted to make the comment that maybe it's not, maybe the numbers aren't as, as ugly as we think they are. Yeah. But we know what he wants, which is what you said. So we should wrap up here. We, we, we should wrap up. Um, one thing that's really clear from these two chapters is the early church would have known bad stuff was coming. And it was coming on the people around them as well. Uh, keep in mind there were huge plagues going on in the Roman Empire at this time. And what this is a message is, is that the things around them that they're experiencing, wars, devastation, plagues, you know, rain of frogs, whatever, like these are things that are not so outside of the will of God that we take it for granted in the modern church we have this very bedrock doctrine God is in control but this is not a common idea in the ancient pagan world gods had very limited power and they were not they didn't have overlap and one of the things this passage really drives home is no even the bad stuff the stuff that is under the control of God now that raises the next obvious question what is God thinking when he does this stuff that I am not qualified to answer um but I can tell you this, this or the early church would have interpreted this as, wow, even the bad stuff is from God. And, and giving opportunities to repent. And, and given opportunities to repent and re-examine, I, maybe it's time to re-examine my life choices. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the question is, how much do I think is literal versus allegorical? Great so, question. 71%. I, I don't know. <laughs> and I won't say which is which. I think there's a process. We talked about this in the podcast. There's definitely a process. That some people only repent when they hit that immovable obstacle, <laughs> right? There's clearly a dynamic in human choosing that sometimes you just got to drink a bowl of wrath before you see the light, right? I hope that none of us are in that situation, but man, if you find yourself in that situation, start looking at your life choices and going, all right, I got to Honestly, I, gotta, I think many of us got saved because we hit the wall. I, I heard a pastor one time who had been a vineyard pastor and had fallen away through immorality and and he delivered a sermon after he'd come through the other side and he entitled it The Divine Body Slam. <laughs> the punishment God reserves for those people that think they're smarter than him. And he gave this whole amazing testimony about just being absolutely just laid low by God until he finally got it. Right, and so there was a place for him at the end of all this of like, I don't want to drink any more wrath. Lois, okay, Michael, Lois. Son of Hamas you know, becomes a Christian. 
to me, this is such a beautiful picture of the play out of this battle happening right now. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of wrath going on in the world right now, to be sure. Well, Rod, look, Rod, let's look at you. Let's look at you going to Vietnam. I mean, let's look at you going to Vietnam. The, the thing is, we haven't really seen this stuff, but it's it's happening all the time, and some of us some of us have to experience it. And and you know, I mean, not to get all personal, you talked about it publicly before, but but what role did the PTSD from Vietnam play in in you giving yourself to God? And honest, and that's a graphic example, but I think that's how it works. I, part of my thing is repent early, repent often. Right? <laughs> don't, 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 don't pick up a bowl full of wrath. And this That's, is an example of us escaping the wrath. We've yeah, talked about how all yeah, of us share it. Learn the easy the way. 15 is, the bowls are uh, escape the wrath of God uh, by becoming the people of God. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't get to develop. God's part in wrath and, and, and uh, how that uh, expresses his heart of love. Uh, and hopefully we can, we can, that can be another discussion in the next two weeks. Let's close in prayer. And we're, we're close to eight. So is, is our custom uh, break into groups of three ish. And um, I would say, just talk about um, how God has used pain uh, to soften your heart and give you relief. Does that make sense? So break into twos with threes Pray for each other, and then uh, have a good night. Is there any lasagna left, or is it all gone? All right, so I'll be running into the room to take the rest of the lasagna. Lord Lord Jesus, we thank you for this group and a lot of tough questions and discussion tonight and trying to interpret something that's rather bizarre. We just ask you to fill this room with your presence, even as we pray for each other, that, uh, that you would answer our prayers as we love each other. In Jesus' name, amen.